All right. Who wants to listen to me talk about some sociological babble that I came up with at two o'clock in the morning while the Morrowind soundtrack lingers in the background? You do? All right then, well, let's get a move on then. You know, if there's one thing that never ceases to amaze me about my home country of the UK, it's that in proportion to our minuscule size, I mean, you can see here, just this tiny island that you can barely even make out on the world map, we really have had such an, a disproportionate amount of influence over the world in comparison to our size. You know, being the, the status quo, business language of the world, uh, forging nations and having so much influence over nations, you know, it really is quite incredible uh, how much the British punch above their weight. And I, one of the reasons I think that is is because this island it is home to so many unusual, uh, wacky, and in many ways great thinkers. And one of these thinkers is a guy who you've probably never really heard of before called Jeremy Bentham. Bentham, excuse me. And uh, he kind of looks like Benjamin Franklin, in a way. For all you Americans out there, he must be a distant relative of sorts. <laughs> but, you know, he, this guy was an, an 18th century social reformer. And, you know, he's known for a few things, but one of the things he's, he's known for is kind of being the godfather of what's known as utilitarianism, which sounds complicated, but it essentially just means that the ultimate aim is to maximise happiness for the maximum amount of people. That is kind of like the the basis of utilitarianism. And you know, when you hear that and, and look at that, you kind of think like, oh wow, well that sounds great, right? Like, I like to be happy and I want to maximise my own happiness and happiness for other people, you know, what could possibly go wrong, <laughs> right? However, when I hear about utilitarianism, <laughs> I can't help but become very, very uh, angry and disappointed <laughs> because it's one of those things that sounds good as is often the case with ideas. And yet, when put into practice, it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. So, you know, let's break this down a little bit. The ultimate aim is to maximise happiness for the maximum amount of people, right? Well, let's take the first part. The ultimate aim is to maximise happiness. Well, a question we've got to ask there, then, is why should happiness be the ultimate goal? Right? Because we all like to be happy, right? It's not a bad thing to be happy. But is it really the be-all, end-all? And, you know, this image comes to mind, and... I've had this image saved for quite some time, and I don't know where I got it from, and at this point I'm not sure I want to know, but... You know, as you can see, this guy's probably quite happy, right? He's got some really great tasting food, he's got a machine that feeds it to him, he's being pumped with medication, assumedly to make him even more happy. Uh, you know, he's, 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 got, he's been on vacation there, holiday in the back, he's got a partner who's just like him. You know, he's, he's scrolling social media, he's very comfortable. Like, this guy's probably really happy, he's not got much to stress about. Well, apart from his cholesterol. But, you know, he, he seems, this guy's probably living a quite happy life. Uh, you know, he seems to have, everything about his life revolves around comfort and, and minimising uh, pain. And, and right. So, But I don't think anyone looks at this guy and says, gosh, I wish I was him. Right? I, don't, I don't think anyone looks at this guy and goes, I'm really envious. People look at this guy and go, this is horrific. Right? This is an abomination. This, there's something gone very wrong here. Because we know deep down that there's more to life than comfort. You know, there's more to life than just plain happiness. You know, what makes people truly... What, what people truly desire it is really a sense of achievement, some sort of goal, some sort of aim that they can go for. And happiness is then gained from that. You know, happiness is a motivator. It's not really the be-all, end-all. And this image summarises that really well. And, and then we've got to look at the other part, which is for the maximum amount of people, which kind of is a democratic mandate, if you think about it. So, you know, an example, well, a question we've got to ask there then is, does a higher quantity of happiness overrule a lower quantity of sadness? Right? And so an example of that would be, here's me, and as you can see, this is a picture of me sleeping. I'm, I'm very happy, as you can tell, I must be having a fantastic snooze. Um, however, then all of a sudden, two artificial intelligence clones of me from hell appear. And as you can see by the look on their faces, they're not very happy that they're not real. Okay, and so they see me, who is real, and they, they want to beat me up in my sleep. All right, they want to beat me. 
And obviously that wouldn't make me very happy, because I'm having a great snooze, I would rather be left alone. But these guys would be very happy if they, if they, if they were allowed to do that. So, you know, if we're all about maximising happiness for the maximum amount of people, and there's only three people, and two of them are happy from beating up one man, well that's two versus one. So does that mean that they should be allowed to beat me? Because it would make them, it would make them happy? You know, you kind of, you kind of enter these kind of moral quandaries when you when you start to think utilitarian in a utilitarian fashion, because in in the utilitarian worldview, the answer is yes, they should be allowed. But obviously, it's not moral to beat people, right? So it's a very machine-like way of thinking, in a way. So it's one of those ideas that, you know, it sounds good when you first hear about it, you you know, you think, oh yeah, well who could oppose that, but in reality, it's one of those things that's probably left on the drawing board, really, or, or at least without some sort of changes, and, and that's what people have done to, to utilitarianism, they've kind of changed it to try to make it more moral, but the, the root idea is still bizarre. But, you know, the, the point is that I'm not really here to talk about utilitarianism, to be honest with you. I'm here, really, to say that, you know, Bentham was a really out-of-the-box thinker, right? He was, a, he was someone from a time long gone by who looked at the world and said, how can I make this better? And he wanted to reform a lot of things. He, he wanted to reform uh, schools. He wanted to reform courts. He wanted to reform parliament. But the thing that he's known the most for wanting to reform is prisons. All right, so he, he really wanted to reform prisons, again, to make them better. And this is where we come to the panopticon, right? Even the word sounds sinister, right? It's like foreshadowing. Um, but it's not, it wasn't meant to be. So a panopticon, the idea of the panopticon is it, it comes from the Greek word pantoptes, which I've got no doubt I'm pronouncing wrong because I'm an Englishman and we cannot pronounce any word correctly outside of our language, which is our God-given right. But it means all-seeing. And a panopticon is a type of building, such as a prison, that's designed to be easily and constantly observable from a central post. Okay, so here is two maps that kind of, you know, showcase the idea. The one on the left was a building that was actually made, right? And the one on the right was never made, it was just a plan. But you can see, you've got these hexagonal, again a fantastic shape, and a pentagonal rooms. And in the middle of these rooms, you've got these circle structures, and they have a 360 degree view of all the cells that are lining the walls, right? So in a normal prison, you'd have these corridors and you'd have to walk through them, but that's not necessary uh, here, because you, know, you, you have a full view of them all very easily, right? And here's what they look like on the inside, right? So you can see there the central, the central tower, there and all the cells that are that are surrounding it. Obviously, this one's abandoned, so it's kind of broken down a little bit. Well, a lot, but uh, you you can kind of get the basic idea. And you know the philosophy behind it was very simple. Because prisoners aren't aware exactly when they are being watched, only that they could be, it forces a sort of self-regulation preventing potential negative behaviour and ultimately making both the prisoners' and guards' lives much easier. And, you know, it could theoretically even function without guards sometimes, right? So, the prisoners don't know when they're being watched, only that it's possible that they could be, uh, and, that, and that kind of makes them think, okay, well, I've always got to be on my best behaviour uh, because I could be being watched. Uh, and, and that would lower tensions between prisoners and guards, right? So that, that's the philosophy. It's, it's, and it's quite a smart philosophy. It, it, it's, it's, it's intelligent. However, <laughs> similar to how utilitarianism was intended to facilitate better decisions to make society more desirable, but in reality just accidentally facilitates hedonism and mob rule, this was intended to create a more peaceful and orderly prison but really, it just accidentally created the most dystopian mind game of all time, right? Because human beings, when you know you could be watched, 
but you don't know when you are being watched. This creates immense paranoia, right? And I mean immense paranoia, because you're always on edge. You know, it reminds me of um, that old Japanese quote, every man has three faces. The first he shows to the world, the second he shows to only his circle, so like friends and family, and the third he only shows to himself, and every single person watching this knows that's true. If it's not true, there's something wrong with you, right? So there were some things that you that you would you would never talk to anyone about. You keep it in your own head. There are some things that you would only trust with your closest friends, your closest family, and then you know then you have this version of you that you you, you show to the world publicly. That's kind. It is you, but it's a very limited version of you. It's a very corporate, rehearsed version of you. Uh, and and it, and it's it, it, yeah, it, it's a very a very friendly version, but it's not really you. It's just a fragment of you. But the problem with constant surveillance and observation and and not knowing when is that, well, the face that you only show to yourself and the face that you only show to your circle, kind of die. You can never show them, because you're always being watched, right? So that you have to. And so what what this does is it 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 almost destroys the person and makes it so they're always on edge and, and it turns them into this sort of I don't know how you would put it, this fragmented being where they, they're always paranoid and always having to they can never really be themselves and they can never really relax around other people they become this sort of corporatized person, you see this with people who work in corporations, right, they're very rehearsed politicians are like this they're always on edge, they're never personal they're never themselves and it's because if you're under constant scrutiny, constant surveillance, you can't be like that. Because one slip up, and that's it, right? And so, you know, that's the that that's the panopticon. And it it, it wasn't intended, you know, Bentham didn't intend it to be this dystopian looking thing. <laughs> but you know, no one really looks at this and goes, wow, that's 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 nice. It, it no, it's very it's disturbing, and intentionally so. Oh, no, no, not intentionally so, unintentionally so, and it, it's make, it makes people very paranoid. Which is why prisons, you know, actual prisons like this don't really function well, because the prisoners kind of go insane a little bit. But of course, you know, in reality, you know, when you're out and about and you're not in a prison, <laughs> you, you, you don't really have to worry about this, because you're not under constant scrutiny or surveillance, right? Like when you're... You know, out in a restaurant or whether you you know you're in your room or whatever and so this constant paranoia isn't really there you know you can kind of have the you know the the face you only show to yourself and the face you only show to your inner circle you don't always have to be this public face well actually not anymore really because the camera right and so back in the past Cameras used to be these really bulky, fat things that you'd have to carry around on your shoulder. You know, they were so heavy. And, you know, eventually they, they got smaller and smaller. But the, the, the point is, is that they were cumbersome. If someone saw you with a camera, they'd think you were really strange. Like, you must work for some company or something. And if you wanted to get the film off the camera, you would have to get it developed. Right? You'd have to go to a store and, like, get, get the film developed. Or It, it was a pain. It was a pain. However, of course, camera technology has has evolved over the years, and now people have a cam people have multiple cameras in their pocket, and they can take it anywhere. And everyone has one, and it's not suspicious, and it's not con it's not seen as strange, right? It's socially acceptable to have a smartphone in public, and you know, well, you know, theoretically, with the film, you don't have to you don't have to get it. Uh, you know, developed. You can take a photo, and it can be on the internet, and millions of people can see it within 10 seconds, right? So so co constant uh, recording, constant photos are now available in the public sphere everywhere, right? But, and, and, you know, and so scenes like this, for example, are very common. I mean, it's not like, you know, you walk out in the street and you see a bunch of crowds with, with their phones out. But in important events, let's say, everyone's filming, New Year's, for example, uh, you know, pe people film everything, people document everything. And there's a certain irony to this, because if you really think about it, that's no different to the panopticon. 
It's just that rather than there being guards in the central tower and prisoners in the cells surrounding, everyone is a warden, right? It's because everyone's watching other people. Everyone has the ability to record and watch other people. But also everyone's a prisoner as well because other people can record them, right? And so in the public sphere, if you think about it, it is now a virtual panopticon. Right? It is it is a prison where everyone watches everyone, but they are also they're also being watched themselves. There's no privacy in the public sphere anymore. Right? Everything can easily be a recorded and and sent moment. And that's that's had a real profound effect on, on, on people's psyches in ways that I don't think people really understand. Right? Like these two things are interchangeable. The mindset of a human being, a prisoner in a panopticon prison, is exactly the same now as people growing up in public in the early 20th, uh, in the early 21st century, where everyone has a smartphone. It's the exact same kind of psychology. At any time, you could be watched with relative ease, but you don't know when. Right? It, it, the, the only difference is that you too are a guard. And man, that idea, uh, I don't know, when I, it, 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 it's, it's one of those that you really have to linger on for a little bit. And, and the effects of this virtual panopticon are, are threefold. Number one, it captures people's worst moments and makes them easily shareable. Yeah, so a few weeks ago I saw this video that went viral on, on uh, X. And it was this video, it's a terrible video, and it was of a guy who worked at a hotel reception. And the guy clearly had something wrong with him. He, he, was, he was mentally ill, he, he might have had a form of autism or something. And he made a mistake, and a customer started filming him. And he couldn't handle that. He couldn't handle the fact that, because, he, you know, he, he, he's, he's very, kind of like a, uh, someone who's not got very good social skills and doesn't really know how to respond to making a mistake and being filmed and humiliated because of it. And he started banging his head against the the, monitor, the computer monitor and the wall and, you know, smashing the, the keyboard. Not not angrily, but crying, sadly, like someone who was under severe mental distress. And that was shared over the internet and it got tens of thousands of likes and people were commenting on it and making fun of the guy. And, and that really broke my heart, to be honest with you. Because what that does is, you know, it incentivizes... When you can... When you know that you can get attention on the internet from showcasing someone going through a distressing mental breakdown like that, it, it, it incentivizes hum more humiliation. But not only that, it, it creates these kind of hall monitors who get off on, on laughing at other people and, 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 and saying like, oh, look at how, look at, ooh, what, what's he doing? What's wrong with them? Like, oh, I'm so much better than them. Right? And, and people like to lecture others and, and, and ponder others' failures because it makes up for their own lack of successes in their own lives. And that's exactly what cancel culture is. Right? Like, oh, look at this guy who's done something so terribly wrong. You know, let's all, let's all pile, like, 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 uh, pile on them and, and laugh at them and mock them because we're, we are so much morally superior than them by doing that. You know, and, it, and it's... Yeah, that's really sad. That's, that's really sad. But number two is that in response to that, it makes people paranoid because they don't want to be humiliated publicly themselves, right? You know, no one wants to be filmed and humiliated. And so there's a lot of people now who in public, they're very sheepish. And and, and what this does is, you know, this turns a person wooden and, and become they become overly conscious and less likely to object to serious controversy or offense as to not cause a scene. Right, so let's say that someone witnesses an injustice, right, in the streets, like I don't know, a crime or someone, someone's, I don't know, someone's going crazy. They don't want to intervene because they don't want to be a part of it. They don't want to be filmed. They don't want to be any. You know, they don't want to be part of this story that will no doubt go viral later. So they avoid it. People become paranoid. You know, people people don't enjoy themselves as much as they used to going outside anymore uh, because your worst moments could be publicized to the world 
I know a lot of people like this, by the way. A lot of people, usually men, strangely, young men, very paranoid. And number three is, it can force people to create an artificial false positive persona. Yeah, so a few years ago, I was I was going to uh, Wales, which is a part of the UK. And I was with uh, some family and some people I know. And one of the people, which was this this woman, I won't say who, but they they started filming with their phone outside of the car, like outside of the window. They weren't driving for the record, but you know they were in the passenger seat filming outside. And then I saw them post the video on social media. And I asked them, why did you do that? Because there's nothing going on, right? There's nothing interesting going on outside. They were literally just filming the motorway, right? With a bunch of trees. And I, I, I was confused, like, well, what did you do that for? And when I called them on that, they got very sheepish. And they were like, uh, you know, oh, you know, like as if I just saw something that I shouldn't have seen. They were very embarrassed. And they were like, oh, you know, shut up, shut up. You know, and, and I thought to myself, well, you know, answer the question. What, what were you doing that for? And I realized later that the reason they were doing it is because they wanted to showcase their little friends on social media. Look at me, I'm I'm going somewhere, I'm not inside the house, I'm doing things. And the psychology behind that is, you know, it makes people it makes people think that you're you're like, oh look, 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 they're better, right? Like why do you think people take photographs whenever they do the slightest little thing and post it on social media? It's because they want people to look at them and go, look at how great I am. Right? And, that, and that can take over people's lives because eventually it can slowly over an extended period of time make people forget who they even are because they've spent so long molding their life around impressing other people right so you, you spend all every waking moment thinking if i do this how will people see me you know oh, i want to be liked by people i'll do this this and this and then you forget who you like what do you what do you want what do you think and that's very common in women you know paranoia is very common in men but this this kind of false persona very common in women and so, you know, humiliation, paranoia, you know, falsity, these, these things subconsciously underline the culture of the early 21st century because of this virtual panopticon that people find themselves in, where whenever they're in public, they can constantly be humiliated. They have to, it makes people paranoid and it makes people want to become a false personality to try and, to try and, ugh. I don't know, be seen, be seen better by other people. Never used to be like this. In the 20th century, you ask people who were, you know, young or old in the 1990s or 1980s, people lived in the moment. They didn't fear these things, right? Because not everything was a record or recorded. And, you know, even if it was, you couldn't just spread it far and wide. You know, people lived in the moment. And there was, there was, so there was no virtual panopticon. And so, you know, again, you know, the, the, the world we live in today with, with this technology has created this, this virtual, this virtual panopticon. But what if I told you <laughs> it's even worse than that? <laughs> it's, yes, it's even worse than that. Because it's one thing to be, to, to be aware that there's a chance that you could be filmed in public at any given time. But imagine not knowing when, like, like, there's a chance that you could be filmed, and you're not even a, you're not even aware of it, and that's what the that that what's in his hand there is a hidden camera. Look at how tiny it is, and you know lately there's been a lot of hidden cameras in places like hotels and Airbnbs that people have found in fake smoke detectors or clocks, and you know women having showers and in changing rooms and things. You know, people put these little minuscule hidden cameras in there that are the size of a dot. And as long as they're connected to a battery or power or, or, it, or, or some sort of cellular network or Wi-Fi, it's streamed 24-7. And so, you know, now whenever you go to a hotel or, or a public toilet or any public place, you don't even know. You don't even know if you're being filmed or not. You could be. You could be on some website. You know. You. You go. You. Let's say you go to the toilet, right? Someone could have. Someone could have images of your. You know what? Just from using a public toilet. So now you know. And, and you know. Obviously, if people don't know about these hidden cameras, 
then they're not going to worry about them because they're hidden and they don't know they exist. But as soon as you realize that this is a possibility, right? Like this is a thing that exists and has happened to people. You can't even trust that, right? And, and here's the thing. If you're in a rented accommodation or some sort of apartment, they could be in your room right now. Right, and that's really scary, right? And that, that you know that creates the a virtual panopticon, even in your own private quarters, even in your own private domain. And it sounds obviously it's very unlikely, right? But it's unlikely, but it's easy, right? And that's that's oh man, you know, at that point, your entire life is a showcase for other people, right? And so, you know, you can take the humiliation, the paranoia and the falsity and you can increase that by 10 times at that point. Because when you when you start to even question of your own personal quarters or, you know, like places that seem private but aren't, like public toilets, let's say. Man, you know, that's that 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 makes people lose their marbles. You know, and 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 so again, you know, this hidden camera is it only in, 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 if you know about them, if you don't know about them, it's not a panopticon because you don't know you're being watched. But if you know this is a possibility, it, in, it enhances the panopticon in even more places. And, you know, it gets even worse, though, because if you, if you think about it, the cameras are only going to get smaller and smaller. And who's to say in the future, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, cameras can be so small that they're nano sized. Like less than the size of a fly and they can fly around. So you could have 50 cameras in your room and you couldn't even tell. They're in the air. And they're being live streamed everywhere. And everyone, <laughs> there's some guy who's severely paranoid who's listening to this right now thinking, oh my God, I'm even worse. I feel even worse now. Who's to say these don't exist now? Right? Who's to say this isn't how people get blackmailed and compromised, right? It's a very interesting thought, and you know. By the way, and if it doesn't exist now, it will exist in the future. It's inevitable, right? It's really is. It really is one of those things that it's inevitable. And at that point, you're not private anywhere. So yes, it, that's a thought, right? And so when people hear about this, you know, these cam these camera technologies everywhere, and the, how they connect to the internet, and how everything is surveilled, people love to hate the technology. Right, and they go. They say things like, "Oh, I wish I, I wish we could just ban smartphones and cameras and go back in time and before the times of the technology, and we'd all be so happy." But here's the thing: technology is just a tool. You know, an old, you know, similar to how guns don't kill people, people wielding them do. You know, smartphones don't record themselves. Hidden cameras don't get placed by themselves. People use them for malicious purposes. And, right, and so you can't get angry at the technology, you've got to get angry at the people behind it. And, you know, there's no point wishing that you could, oh, you know, I wish I could, we, we, I, would, I was around in the 60s when, you know, no one had smartphones and everyone lived in the moment and it was nice. Tough, you're not. And technology cannot be unmade when it's made anyway. Even the Amish, who don't use technology, supposedly, even they have started to use, some of them have started to use uh, phones and technology because they can't even function in the state without them anymore, right? The Amish. So there's no point thinking that way, really. And so at this point, you're probably thinking, well, so, you know, are we just screwed then? Like, is that it? Are we just doomed to live in this virtual panopticon forever and we have to accept that there's no such thing as privacy and every waking moment we have could potentially be filmed and there's nothing we can do about it and it will be live streamed in every country on Earth forever and, and that's it? Like, is this it now? And, well, I do actually think that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Because while this technology isn't going anywhere and will only get better and the world will only get more interconnected, I do think that there is something rather unexpected that may be able to remedy this. And you'll never guess what it is. AI. Right, so Mac computers back in like the, 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 you know, the 1990s and the 2000s, they used to, Apple used to advertise that they, they don't get any malicious software. Like, you don't have to worry about malicious software going on your machine. 
And the, the, you know, the reason for that was really, it, it wasn't really that they were immensely secure machines, it was that Max had security through obscurity, right? So, so like, the idea was that so few people used Max in comparison to Windows machines, it was like 98% Windows, 2% Mac, that if you were someone making malicious software to say, I don't know, take money from people or something, why would you aim for the 2% of people using Macs when you can aim for the 98% of people using Windows, right? It, it, like, it didn't really make sense to make malicious software for the Mac because the user base who would get it is so much smaller. And that ironically made a more secure system just by the reality of the situation, right? So it's security through, through obscurity. In the future, I think we might have the opposite with artificial intelligence, which is security through uniformity, in the sense that artificial intelligence is so universal that people are secure from that alone, which sounds bizarre, but you know, take this image for example. This is an image <laughs> of uh, obviously an artificial intelligence uh, edited image of me, thank God. And it's me, but I'm like five times fatter. I'm like unbelievably obese. I've got three chins. And a friend of me took a frame of a, of a production I made once and put it through an AI and he sent me this. And, you know, I thought it was always, I thought it was so amusing. I've kept it for, it's. It, it, this is over a year old now, I think. But I kept it because I thought, you know, that kind of does look a bit realistic. Horrifically realistic. But if I was that, that fat, I probably would look like that. Let's be honest. Like that doesn't look edited. As I know it sounds bizarre to say that because it's such a, a, a gruesome image, but it does look like a person, right? Like, okay, it's a bit off, but it, it does look like <laughs> a human being could look like that, right? Like, it's not obvious. And I always thought that was very uh, incredible how you can take a, one picture of someone and radically morph it into something completely different. Yeah, and there's another one, there's, there's others of me, like there's one of me that looks like a woman, but I'm not going to show that one because it's very disturbing. But, you know, the point, the point is proven, like one image, one image is all that people need, and that's quite crazy. But it's not just images, it's voices as well, you know, uh, someone I know, they, they took some, a voice clip of me, probably from one of my productions, and they put it through this AI, and the AI took my voice and you could now type anything into it and it would come out in my voice and so I'd like to play a little recording of, of the thing that they made me say. I am so turned on by Funko Pops. Not in a harem way, but I wake up in the morning and salivate from the sight of that colourful plastic. How I want to plant my lips on these sweet, attractive figurines let me caress them day by day, and I will be in heavenly bliss. Right, and of course you can tell that that's, you know, it, that's not me. You can tell that that's kind of like, it's a bit broken, a little bit artificial. But they have my voice down, right? Like the, the basics of my voice are there. And it does sound like me, and in a few years' time, with enough refinement, you could essentially make me say anything, right? And so the point is that... In the future, it's inevitable that everyone's image and voice, for better or worse, can be used in such a way. Right, so if someone has 10 seconds of your voice, they can make it say anything. If someone has one image, they can, make, they can, they can turn you into anything or make you do anything. That is inevitable. And this will no doubt <laughs> lead to a lot of lawsuits, legislation and more, because, you know, recently, uh, we, we, we've heard about this. One of the biggest musicians in the world, Taylor Swift, uh, recently had her, her image taken and, and was morphed to do, you know, make AI images of her doing very questionable things. And, and this, you know, this prompted them to, I, I think, to, to call for some sort of laws to prevent this and things like that. Which is understandable because, of course, people don't want their images used without their permission. I mean, you know, the, the image of me up there in the voice clip, that's fine because it's friends of mine doing it. And I, and I think... You know, when people do that to me and I know them, it's amusing to an extent. But if it's, a, if, you know, if it's a stranger doing it, some anonymous being, and they're taking your image and morphing it to make you do God knows what or say God knows what, that's very disturbing for people. 
And so you can kind of understand why people would want that legislated or punished, right? That's completely understandable. However, I have a bit of an unusual judgment about this, a bit of an unusual thing, and I think that while certain artificial intelligence generations obviously have to be cracked down on as much as possible, such as illegal generations, um, when it comes to general, general things like, I don't know, someone takes an image of you, let's say, and makes you dance, right? Like they make you dance in like, I don't know, dressed up as a chicken or something like that, like something comedic. There's an argument to be made that if something happens to everyone, it also essentially happens to no one. In the sense that if everyone can be effortlessly manipulated by artificial intelligence, that's bad, but it, but it can also, because it happens to everyone, it also doesn't really matter, if that makes sense. Because, you know, if you can be made to, you know, wear a chicken outfit and dance, everyone else can. And so if someone sees you like that, well, they can be like that as well. And so it's not like, while you are kind of having your image morphed, everyone else can. So it's not as bad, right? Like, if something happens to you as an individual uniquely, that's terrible. But if something happens to everyone, again, it's almost like it happens to no one. Because if everyone's image can be manipulated, well, who, you, you know what I mean? Everyone's on an equal playing field. I hope that makes sense. I know it's just an unusual thought, but if you think about it, it does make sense. And so, you know, humiliation, paranoia, and falsity, all these things, you know, they, they kind of disappear with, with, with the rise of artificial intelligence, because how can you be humiliated if everyone can be? How can you, why, why bother being paranoid if it's so easy anyway and everyone can do it? Why bother trying to build a false persona if everything's false anyway, because you can't even believe your eyes. There's no point. And so, you know, the bottom line is that manufacturing and manipulation of incredibly lifelike images, videos, and audio in the digital world will soon be incredibly easy for even the most tech inexperienced individual to do. Right? And so, you know, these images, for example, which look like a plane, a plane's engine being on fire, and some sort of nuclear weapon outside of a, a an aeroplane window. Up close, these look real. They look like something that, like a legitimate photograph that's been taken. But in reality, they're not real. They're just they're just AI generated. But someone could post these on social media with some sort of you know false title, and people would believe it because they look so realistic. And and you know, okay, maybe if you zoom in a little bit today you'll be you, you'll be able to tell like oh that's not right like that cloud looks a little bit you know draw like a drawing for example but in the future this isn't going to be the case you're not going to be able to tell facts from fiction in the digital world anymore right the internet will essentially be one big farce and but but that therefore means that there will be no point taking any image, video, or audio in the real world because it will not be seen as credible or even interesting compared to the fakes regardless, right? So here we have, you know, the, the CEO of Apple, you know, introducing the, uh, the eye brush, a new toothbrush from Apple, or the eye dog, right? A new dog, mechanical dog from Apple. And of course, these are fake, right? But, you know, if you, they look real. Like, that, that does look like the CEO of Apple. And that kind of does look dis like dis indistinguishable from reality, at, at least from far away. And when these things can be turned into video with voices attached to it, I mean, how can you tell? How can you possibly tell what's what's fact or fiction then? And so there's no real point taking videos or photos to post on the internet in the future because you like. Let's say that you went on vacation, holiday, right? You go to Paris or something, and you're next to the Eiffel Tower. Well, you could you could just you could have just AI generated that. You literally could have made that in five seconds with a computer. So what's the point of actually taking the image when you're there, apart from personal journaling? And personal journaling doesn't need to be posted on the internet because no one will believe it anyway, right? That's the point. And you know that therefore means that the way people treat others in reality may increasingly resemble the way it was before the internet was even invented as a result, right? So these images here, 
uh, they look like Japan in the 1990s, right? But they're not. They're completely artificial. They're completely AI. And that's but that that world here that we're seeing could be the world that we're about to go back to in reality, right? In the sense that this 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 smartphone this this virtual panopticon where you're a prisoner in public and potentially in private will no longer exist. People will no longer feel the need to film everything and have these false personas. They will they they may be enhanced by virtual technology such as wearables like headsets, visors, or glasses that will that you know that will help them out in the real world, but they won't talk to people like they're in a prison, like they fear judgment, because 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 unless you can see it with your own eyes anyway you're not going to believe anything that you see on the internet anyway. And so that means that you will live in the moment and appreciate reality a lot more and appreciate people in person a lot more because it's the only thing that you can trust. The virtual world cannot be trusted in a world like in, 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 with this technology. And so people might communicate better with people. You know, if someone's having a mental breakdown in public, they might not bother filming it because no one's going to believe it anyway. And some artificial intelligence generation could be much more entertaining for people and it's not even real. People might actually help the person, right? And so narcissism might go down. Uh, people might be much more humbled. And, you know, maybe this is wishful thinking. I don't know, but... Uh, I. I don't like it when people demonize everything about AI. I think you've got to really think forward and look at the psychology and sociology of it. There are, there are some potential good things about this technology that, that, that may be a complete upgrade to the very dystopian panopticon world that we live in today. And so, yeah, the panopticon exists today. We live in it. But in the future, it might disappear because we'll, be, we'll, we'll have security through uniformity. Right? Everyone can be manipulated. Everyone's image can be manipulated for better or worse, but if everyone can, it's, it's basically the same as no one can. And that means people can relax in public and private, and, and people might treat people better as a result of that. At least in reality, maybe not in the digital world, where, you know, it, well, you know, that's the point, really. Kind of, right? Kind of? Because, you know, there are some downsides to this. Like, what, what about CCTV? CCTV is not going to be trustworthy anymore. What if you meet what if you meet a partner on the internet? How can you know that that voice that they use every day is actually theirs? How can you know that the images and even if they went on like FaceTime for example, how can you know that that, that video is them? How do you know that's not an AI? Right, we have filters that do things like this. There are a lot of you know people might start to look for people in reality more. Dating apps for example may completely uh, collapse as well. I mean, people are already illegitimate on there. You know, a lot of things might have to be done in person a lot more because the internet becomes so massive and filled with, 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 with AI that, you know, basically the, the internet may be seen in the future as sort of like a, just a way to interact with robots rather than people. And the reality, people may start to appreciate people in reality a lot more rather than just viewing reality as an extension of the, the online world. They may start to see it as the real world again. But that has some downsides, you know, preventing crime, for example, uh, illegal generations. These are things that people really have to think about. And, and, and so it's not, it's not going to be sunshine and rainbows completely. But nevertheless, you know, there are, there are some good signs to that. And if it break the virtual panopticon dying and freeing people again, I think that that's going to be a good thing for people's psyche. And so either way, though, the future is now. And it's going to be very, very interesting. And I look forward to seeing you know, how the world's going to be and the sociology of that over the next 10 and 20 years. It's going to be really interesting. Because the last 10 and 20 years has been very depressing to observe with the virtual panopticon. It's clear that people are very mentally ill today and it's very selfish and it's not good. And so hopefully there'll be a, a new, a, a, good, a, a good development from this. But the, anyway, there we go, folks. That's all. And uh, fun. I, I want to thank the patrons uh, who support these productions. But fun fact, this was edited completely on a phone. <laughs> yeah, so... 
you know, if, if my audio sounds a bit worse than usual or the editing, I apologize, but uh, the, the reason why is because I'm currently doing some serious office renovations and so my setup is actually all boxed up. <laughs> So I can't, I can't use it at the moment, So, but I did, I, it's taken a bit longer than I thought. I thought I'd be done you know, by the end of January, and at the time of recording, it's currently uh, the, like, entering the second week of February. So it's taken a bit longer than I thought, and I didn't want to keep you waiting, but um, I hope you don't mind. I hope you don't mind. I don't know. I don't know when it'll be done, hopefully soon, but I, I'm, I'm trying to get there as fast as possible. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, I hope it gave you something to think about. Uh, for better or worse, and uh, yeah, on that note, I'll see you next time.